Well, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Representative Ro Khanna from the 17th Congressional District in California. He's a man that represents a very interesting piece of uh, territory in our country because Silicon Valley, basically, so you've got Facebook and you have Google and Apple in your district. Um, and I've been eager, Congressman, for a while to talk to you because I find your positions uh, intriguing. You're a little hard to pin down, which I like, <laughs> you know. And uh, speaking from the standpoint of Catholic social teaching, you know, famously, Catholic social teaching corresponds to neither of our political parties. It's part of its genius, I think. You know, you can't say, oh, it's clearly Democratic, clearly Republican. It's also a source of ongoing frustration for Catholics every election cycle, you know. So whom do we vote for, Bishop? Right. And we say, well, you know, Catholic social teaching says X, Y, and Z, and A, B, and C, and now you got to make up your mind and conscience. So I, I thought we could chat about some things maybe in relation to Catholic social thought and then your own uh, thinking on, on political matters. So, Well, that would be wonderful. Look, I uh, am so honored to be here. I remember reading one of your pieces on Christmas where yeah. you talked about how we are drawn out of ourselves because of a baby and how Jesus came as a baby. And I, th I just thought, what a uh, obvious but brilliant insight. I never mm. thought about that, you know, having kids, that that is something because of their vulnerability, that yeah. it draws you to them. And so we tweeted that out, and I'm oh, uh, good. really honored to be here. Oh, thank you very much for that. And we can't resist the charm of a baby. So God becomes a baby, <laughs> lure us right yeah. out of our self But I never thought of that before. I mean, even though it's so obvious, it's uh, so sometimes the, uh, the obvious and then pointing it out just makes you think about the world in a different place, which is, which is why I uh, and we could get into it. I think it's so important to engage with yeah. uh, the religious traditions in the right. public s sphere. And sometimes, I mean, I'm, look, I'm of, of Hindu faith, and I often say, I wish I had more classes about uh, in, in uh, the, the Old Testament, New Testament, just to understand yeah. because it's so rooted in American culture. Well, you just tell me before we sat down that uh, Leonard Cass was a teacher of yours at the University of Chicago. Le Leon Cass. Uh, Leon Cass. And then he has that wonderful book on, um, on Genesis uh, that's based on seminars he gave there, right, at, the, at U of C. It is. And, and I had three quarters on the Genesis with him. And you know, I still remember certain things, which it, where, where I remember when, uh, you know, he talked about Abraham. And of course, there's a f philosophical and religious part to it. But he said, yeah. think about this. You're in your 80s or 90s, and you're, God, God calls you and says, leave everything you know, and you're going to go and uh, start a new country. And the ambition that that takes and the yeah. daring it takes. So he... he uh, taught the, the Genesis in a way that made you feel that this was about uh, humanity and our ambitions, our greeds, our, our impulses. No, quite right. That's a great book. Hey, listen, you mentioned your, uh, your Hindu and Indian background and the fascinating connection between your grandfather and Mohandas Gandhi. Yes. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. So your grandfather actually worked with Gandhi, went to prison. Right, he went to it, because he, of his support he, for Gandhi. He was younger. He worked with someone called Lala Lajpat Rai, who was part of the Indian Freedom Movement. But then he went to jail alongside Gandhi in 1942 to 1946 as part of the uh, Indian Independence Movement. And of course, Gandhi, as you know, famously uh, came up with this idea of Satyagraha, yeah. which is a, a active resistance, but that's nonviolent, uh, and was heavily influenced by the Gita, but also by the Sermon of the Mount, by Tolstoy. Uh, and it, it's interesting because I think there was a lot of sort of nonviolent interaction with an, another person, but Gandhi took it that we could do this at a political level. Right. And I find Gandhi intriguing for so many reasons. And one is what you just referenced, that he comes as a young law student to London, late 19th century, and he's very shy figure, but eventually he meets a group of Christians who encourage him to read the Bible. Right. And like a lot of first-time Bible readers, he found the Old Testament kind of puzzling. But he thrilled to the New Testament, especially Matthew 5, 6, and 7, right. the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. And Gandhi finds this teaching on nonviolence. He goes to his Christian friends and says, hey, this is marvelous. And they say, well, we don't take that all that seriously at all. It's just for private purposes or right. whatever. But Gandhi realized it was, it was dynamite, and then he used it. You know? And the great thing there is he understood it was not passivity in the presence of evil, but it was a very creative way to engage evil. Um, King, very influenced by Gandhi, yes. and also as a Christian, obviously, by Matthew. The other great figure, I think, is John Paul II. So yes. now late 20th century, John Paul II in Poland. 
up against, you know, a giant army, nuclear weapons and everything. He has none of that, but had that soul force that Gandhi talked yes. about. And, you know, when he speaks of, of God in front of a million people in, in Warsaw, and they begin chanting, we want God, we want God, prescient observers, um, Brzezinski being one of them, said it's over. They realized at that moment the Soviet right. domination was over because John Paul had unleashed something. So talk about that a little bit. What's still the the power of someone like Gandhi? You sit on the Armed uh, Services Committee, right? right? So you're not obviously an advocate of doctrinaire nonviolence, no. but yet what, what are we still able to learn from Gandhi and King, John Paul II today? Well, they represent, in my view, the uh, highest calling uh, of humanity. Uh, yeah. So for, for, for Gandhi... Uh, there was this sense that, okay, if you're faced with evil uh, and the British Empire at the time was far stronger militarily, yeah. uh, that you overcome it with goodness and that you overcome it not because of weakness. I mean, it was strength, but you that, that force ultimately uh, melts hearts, changes minds. Uh, there are scenes from the Indian independence movement where you had uh, people going and getting beaten, and then another row of people would come and get beaten, yeah, and another right. row. And I, I think it just inspires us uh, for what, what, what's the best, the most divine part of, uh, of human existence. Now, that doesn't mean that as a nation, if you face terrorism, that, you know, we're going to, you know, with Hamas perpetrators right. do that. I mean, we obviously, there's, in my view, a na need for for force and, 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 and just force. But in our interactions on a daily basis and in what we can aspire to as humanity, uh, it seems to be the North Star. You know, you mentioned the, uh, at least indirectly, the just war tradition within Christianity. So in the very earliest centuries, you have a lot of the church fathers would advocate practically a nonviolent stance. You know, they would say Christians can't participate in the army and so on. It's Augustine in the fourth and, and in the fifth century who articulates the just war tradition. It's completely misconstrued if you see it as some kind of a warmongering move or right. an encouragement to war. Just the contrary. Augustine accepted what he called the metaphysics of peace. But he felt that within a you know, fallen, conflictual world, sometimes all you can do right. to battle gross injustice is to resort to warfare. But he set these you know, very stringent limits to it. Uh, if you apply the Catholic just war criteria, it seems to me, it, it's hard to find a just war. That's to say both, you know, justifying going to war, but also the waging of the war. Um, I'm curious about the, how many people in Congress would know that tradition, would apply that tradition when looking at issues of, of war and peace? The just war tradition. I'm just I, I, I think there are people who would know it, not, not obviously to your, your depth, but would understand that... Uh, that there are deep ethical principles uh, in, involved, that uh, we shouldn't just be rushing to war. There's probably been a reflection now, actually in both parties, that over the last 20 years, mm -hmm. the United States has uh, gotten into wars uh, without full deliberation and that there should be more restraint and more thought in how we conduct uh, war and what uh, what the human toll is. I mean, I. I do think on matters of war and peace, people really struggle with it, yeah. and, and even if they don't know the, the, the tradition. I mean, members uh, are, do understand the gravity of it. I mean, we're struggling with it today in, the, in what's going on in the Middle East and in Ukraine. Right, because proportionality, discrimination are two key elements when it comes to the waging of war. There's got to right. be a proportionate response, but also a discriminant one. We, we make every effort to discriminate between combatants and non-combatants. Um, and one of the criteria on the way to war is last resort. I've always been struck by that, that, that right. we've exhausted every other means before we get there. And so the, the social teaching tradition of the church keeps us from, from rushing into, you know, armed conflict. But anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, I think it's very important that we keep those criteria in mind as we think through, you know, those issues. And I, I think this is one of the important reasons that we need faith informing yeah. politics, right? Yeah. Because otherwise... You know, the, 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 someone hits you, someone strikes you, the human response is you want to strike them back. And uh, the, the, what, what faith uh, at its best does is makes us pause and think and say, well, what is, what is the, the, the ideal way to live? And that doesn't mean we can always live the ideal way in a, as you put it, fallen world, but certainly it should help 
shape the the action and give us pause, give at least give us uh, some sense of deliberation. Gandhi, King, John Paul II all knew that it was a provocation, real nonviolence, not passivity, but a real provocation, um, revealing the wickedness of someone to himself, that he might see mirrored back, right. this is what I'm doing. There's a, a famous story of John Paul in Poland when um, General Jarl Zelski, who was in charge of Poland at the time, greeted the Pope at the airport, and he had his notes for a little speech, and he stood there, and, and, and he was trembling, because he realized the power of this man, you know. And they say John Paul listened to him very politely and then commenced his own speech. But before he did, he took his papers and he held them out like this, saying, like, I'm not afraid of you. And, and indeed, that was the case. I mean, he had more power than Jaroszewski did. Right. Uh, and I, I wonder if we Christians understand that, we believers understand that, the, the spiritual power that we do wield, you know. Anyway, go ahead. I, I, I think probably not, uh, not as much as... Uh, uh, certainly, as Gandhi or or King or or, or John Paul did, but I, but that's what, if there ever were a time that this country needed uh, spirituality, it's yeah. now. We're so broken uh, as a nation. I mean, you look at the insults we hurl at each other right. on television. You look at the anger, uh, and there isn't a sense of. Uh, of, of common purpose, there isn't this sense of where are we headed. And you know, at its best, uh, it, uh, America is a nation of ideals, of of, of, of a nation that uh, represents the best of hum human values. I wasn't a supporter of Ronald Reagan's ideology, but when he would talk about a shining city of the hill and what America could be, you know, that it sent chills uh, for America. And that's the sense I think that. Uh, we have we have lost and in having uh, spirituality deepen the conversation and also yeah. have some humility because if you have if you believe in a higher power uh, then you probably think you don't have the monopoly on the truth let me let me pursue that with you a little bit because you've mentioned Tocqueville in some of your writings and, right. and speaking and he's kind of an intellectual hero of mine I would take his main point to be a democracy can't really function much less flourish without some undergirding philosophical or religious point of view. So the institutions of a, of a democratic society, both political and economic, are fine in themselves, right. but they won't really function properly unless the entire society is suffused with a religious sensibility, right? Uh, here's something I've noticed in the years I've been following politics and reading. Um, when I was a, a young guy, you'd read people on the left politically. They weren't anti-religious. And go back to like my father's heroes. My father's heroes would have been FDR and would have been JFK and Hubert Humphrey and LBJ, right? I can't think of any of those figures as being anti-religious or anti-spiritual. What I've noticed in the West, let's say 30 years, is the left is becoming increasingly hostile to religion. Uh, not even indifferent to it. I mean, actively hostile to it. And that worries a lot of us because of the Tocqueville principle. Um, you know, I get it. Religion, like anything else, needs to be criticized, and religious people do and say sure. bad things. I get that. But you can't dismiss religion out of hand as something, you know, primitive and irrational. Think of the new atheist critique from, you know, 20 years ago. But I found it's come into the left um, as a kind of unsavory element. So talk to me about that, because you just mentioned the importance of the spiritual in a political conversation. Well, I think it also is important to move people, right? I mean, uh, it's not accidental that uh, King's uh, language yeah. is, uh, uh, is is Christian in so many ways. I mean, he says we don't want a, a thing-oriented society, a people-oriented society. It's not accidental that Gandhi appeals not just to uh, the Bible, but to the Gita and to the to, to Hindu faith and, and to uh, Islamic faith. And, and uh, so because people ultimately aren't just uh, material things. We have uh, higher aspirations, and to touch that, whether it's a sense of patriotism or even higher, a sense of what your obligations are uh, to something beyond uh, th just your human existence is deeply what moves people. So to say that, okay, we're not going to have that conversation mm -hmm. uh, is, is uh, it, it impoverishes our ability to, to have a Politics. Now, it comes from this fear that, yeah. you know, we want to have pluralism in this country. And, uh, and so I think that 
the, the fear was, okay, are we just going to have uh, one faith? But I think America has always, in my view, been a nation of many faiths, and you can celebrate that. And we, we, we can create space for that. So, you know, I'll give you a very yeah, go ahead. childhood story. When yeah. we were moving in to, uh, to, to, to Amsterdam Avenue in, in, in Holland, uh, uh, which was one of the neighborhoods. I was born in Philadelphia. We were moving there. There was a bit of chatter in the street in Bucks County. Like the Kanas are moving in. And we figured mm. out, you know, well, what was, what was going on? And that someone said, well, you know, we're on, on, on Christmas Eve, uh, we put uh, candles out, and now are we going to have a, uh, a house that doesn't have the candle lights out? So my parents kind of laughed, and they said, of course we're going to put the candle lights out. You know, we grew up uh, celebrating uh, Christmas. It doesn't diminish our own uh, faith tradition, and uh, we did that, and we, we, we celebrated, and people on the street celebrated the volley, and were curious. And I think that there has, in my view, having a robust engagement with people's yeah. faith is a better way than telling people don't have faith in the public square. Right. And is it possible to have a religious argument in public? And I use that word argument on purpose because I've been saying for years, it looks for a lot of people like there are two options. Either there's just interreligious violence or there's total privatization. Just right. don't talk about religion. And I would say, no, there's a middle ground, which is robust religious argument that can come out into the public space, not violent, not violent, but intellectually engaged. Why couldn't a, a Hindu and a Christian and a Jew really talk about, and without abandoning their own traditions, but talk out of those traditions and try to find some common ground? Um, this My second observation there is in the Catholic tradition, we talk about the natural law tradition. Right. So you might say underneath, you know, most of the great spiritual traditions is a deep moral sensibility, and that we can find a common ground. Someone like John Courtney Murray in our tradition argued out of that perspective, and that we abandon that at our peril, you know, and then, then it moves into just a complete either indifferentism or just uh, squabbling in the public square. So, I mean, is there a moral consensus that our country can find, call it the natural law consensus, or some fundamental moral sensibility or are we stuck with endless squabbling at that level? So I think there's two things. I mean, I, obviously there there's a, there was a sense, in my view, of, first that there was that the state would have uh, an ability to, to to define the common good, and liberalism emerged saying, well, you know, we've had all these wars, right. we can't agree on this common good, we can't agree w whether it's a a, a, a Protestant, Catholic, Hindu, common good. And so we're going to uh, agree to some basic principles. And those principles are to keep the country safe and mm -hmm. have people have individual rights. The, the challenge is that people still want shared purpose, that that's, right. not, uh, that's not enough. Uh, procedural justice, though important, though deeply yes. important, uh, is not enough. And so then the question becomes, how do we build something Deeper now, to me, one of the greatest uh, articulations of this was Frederick Douglass in Composite Nation, uh, where he speaks in 1869 and he talks about defending the right of Chinese immigrants to come to the United States. And he says, uh, and and they say, well, they're not they're not Christian. How are you defending them? And they're not uh, American. And he says, in the free air of America yeah. and in the free air of our churches, we will have this, and the best will emerge. And this is going to strengthen not only America, it's going to strengthen the churches to have that kind of dialogue. And and to me, that 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 sense that pluralism doesn't mean lowest common denominator. Yeah. Pluralism means challenging your ideas, having something thicker, and still having some thicker conception for America that 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 takes from the best of these. Yeah, and that's the question, that, that thick description of, of the moral life. Douglas is so good, isn't he, at so many levels. Still, yes. an important person to, to go back to. Um, yeah, the question of how do you find it? Um, how do you articulate it? How do you find, how do you find the sense of common good without um, endless conflict, you know? Um, but that the political should be informed by it. What, what I militate against is the privatization of religion, which I've seen advancing in my own lifetime. Um, I get wanting to avoid violence, but I don't think it should move in the direction of privatizing it. Christianity cannot be a private religion uh, right. because we're salt of the 
earth and light for the world and we're the city on the hill and all that. It doesn't mean you propagate it violently or through aggression, but you do propagate it. I mean, by your witness and by your words. And I would say indeed by your public argument. Right. You know? So I try to find that and do, space. Do you feel that people feel judged or, or uh, censored or not allowed to have that kind of perspective going to a town hall uh, making a religious argument, do you yeah. think it's... I think it's there's, well, I think increasingly in our society, that's the case. And, you know, even the suspicion of, of Christian symbols and, as you were talking about, you know, right. religious symbols in the public space. Because we don't want it to move in that direction of a kind of emptied out, Richard John Newhouse's famous, you know, naked public square is just denuded of any religious or moral uh, point of reference. You know, we, we can't have that. And I think that's one of the inflection points in our conversation, you know, around religion. Yeah. Um, and I don't think, you know, when I think back to my parents putting out the candlelights or my tweeting out your, your piece yeah. on, on, yeah. on Christmas, I don't think it's a, a shallowness, right? I mean, some people say, ah, oh, well, it's just the commercialization of Christmas and now everyone has Alpha on the shelf and is giving gifts. It's about something deeper. It's about trying to respect and share what is holy and important to someone else and trying to celebrate that. And the other person reciprocating that in in you. Now, maybe that gets to some common ground. Maybe that uh, strengthens uh, the uh, appreciation for a common direction. But if all I'm saying to you, Bishop Aaron, is, well, I respect your right to exist and me not to hit you and me not to steal from you, that's not a de as not deep enough. a bond yeah, right. as if I say, well, I want to celebrate and understand things that matter to you. Is there a teleology to our political life? I guess is the question. You know, is it actually going somewhere? Are we heading toward a common good? Or is it more of that procedural you know, element you're talking about? Is it merely protective or directive? That, that's, I think, in terms of classical political philosophy. Modern political philosophy tends to say the purpose of government is protective, to protect right. our rights, protect us from, uh, you know, violating each other's rights. But classical political philosophy, Aristotle, Plato, right. Cicero, Aquinas, would be directive. Yes. The purpose of government is to direct us towards some clear sense of the common good. Now, I know that shattered at modernity of the Enlightenment, that, that consensus around the common good, you know. Right. And we're the inheritors of that moment, it seems to me. That, that shattered. So we're left with a kind of proceduralism that's good, but not enough, as you're saying. So that's what we, I think, all need to think through in a fresh way. And then we're always haunted by the specter of violence. The minute you're talking about the, oh, here's the common good. Here's, here's the good right. that we should all be seeking. And someone goes, well, I, I don't agree with that. And then that's my point about argument. Well, can we find a place to argue about it anyway right. publicly without killing each other or, or without uh, falling into complete polarization? To my mind, that's the central struggle maybe in the political life today. I, I completely agree with you. And I think what our nation is trying to do is unprecedented. I yeah. mean, there has yeah. never been a cohesive, multiracial, multi-ethnic, right. multi-religious democracy on, on, on the face of, of the earth. And so we're trying to do this. And, uh, and it's not enough to just have procedural yeah. justice. We, yeah. we want to have a common good, right? A nation is not, when people say America is just an idea, well, yes, it's an idea in the Constitution, but it's also the Revolutionary War, and it's also the blood spilled in the Civil War, and it's also World War II and World War and the Cold War. It's stories and events, and a nation isn't just ideas. And so we, we need to have this common sense of a nation, and yet we have all different folks and different faiths and different traditions coming in. Where do you have a common purpose? I mean, at the very least, it should be in my view, the the engagement and respect of each other, yeah. uh, and and listening and thinking yeah. and the humility. But then, how do we build uh, this this purpose? And in my view, becoming a cohesive, multiracial democracy is pr probably a civilizational achievement that, 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 for America. Yeah, I think of John Paul II there, who said the most fundamental of all the rights is is religious liberty, the right to religious freedom, because it touches the very deepest part of every person. So that's one side of it, isn't it? It's like to allow that, say, yes, I, I'm offering complete religious liberty. But then within that context, f religiously free people coming into a shared space and having a real conversation with each other. That's the next step. If we just say, okay, you know, we're all free and I, right. I'll let you be, you let me be. 
that that's not enough for a cohesive society. But now can we enter this common space and really talk to each other? You know, so anyway, I think that's we're not going to solve that today. But I think that's the issue. Uh, and how, do you think it is? Po do you find leaders uh, without making it partisan who are uh, on either side who are able to speak in a in a spiritual sense to give common direction purpose not to America? Nearly enough. No, I would say that I don't see that in the public conversation. Because um, King did, right? King now. did. Absolutely. It, King and, did. And you'll look at the, you know, the top leadership of the civil rights movement was right. religious. Right. They weren't just part of it. The top leadership was. Um, is that the case now? I don't know. I don't know. I don't think so. So that's the challenge, I think, is for spiritually minded people to get into that conversation and to lead it, you know, as, as King did. Hey, let's talk a little bit about uh, economics. So that's really your background and what you studied, what you taught at Stanford. Um, it may sound more coherent on the economics as opposed no, no, to you're philosophy. Pretty, you're plenty <laughs> coherent on philosophy, too. But uh, we'll move into your, your wheelhouse. Um, as I read you on these economic matters, you seem to be a great advocate of a, you know, kind of targeted investment in the economy so as to stimulate it and make it stronger and to make it fairer and to draw more people into it. And that strikes me as uh, congruent with Catholic social teaching, uh, which favors the market economy. You know, the Catholic social teaching doesn't like the word capitalism, rarely uses it, because I think it's so loaded. You know? right. it, it uses the term market economy, hmm. which it sees as the economic correlate, I think, of a free political uh, environment. So how to free people engage economically right. through the free market. However, the church does not say you know, laissez-faire, just unregulated market, by no means. It should be regulated both politically, governmentally, and morally. Right. The market has, has got to be circumscribed morally and politically. But as I read the church's social teaching, not so that the government can control the market, but to make the market fairer and more available to right. more people. Talk about that a little bit. I, I just find a, a certain point of contact with your own thinking on economics. Well, I, I love how you frame that about how do we shape the market, because that to me is the big question. I mean, obviously, there's a value in the market of freedom. You don't want, if, if I want to have some interaction with you, I don't need to go to the government to get yeah. every interaction yeah. approved. But what has happened is what if you have a society which is just transacting, and it so happens that uh, in my district, uh, you now have $10 trillion of yeah. value. Yeah. And by the way, all this capital uh, is going to China because they have the lowest wage labor there. And places like Johnstown, Pennsylvania, yeah. and uh, Ashtabula and Downriver, Michigan are just hollowed out. Right. And you have no ability for those folks to engage in that transaction. And so to me, the market has to care, care about community, has to care about place, there, there has to be some understanding that you can't just have the concentration of op opportunity. You can't just have capital, especially globally, go to the cheapest labor. There have to be certain standards and there has to be certain economic opportunity for people who want to live in the place that yeah. uh, they, they, they call home. They may want to, you know, you, you, we just think people are actors in a market. And so you're saying to someone, okay, go get retrained, go move. Well, what if what about yeah. their home church? I want to stay here, what yeah. about their family? Yeah. What about their community? Why are those not also important values? Uh, and I think this has been a, another source of the polarization in our our country. One is yeah. the, the, the the challenge of figuring out a common good, but the other is that some people have a much better chance of economic opportunity than others, and depending on where you were born. You're finding common ground with Republicans, too, on this, aren't you? Maybe I am. With uh, Marco Rubio. With Marco Rubio. I Tell mean, me about that, your your kind of collaboration with him on this. Well, Mar Marco Rubio, to his credit, and I, if you ask us for the diagnosis of the problem, it's almost identical. You could, we said, look, there's been the hollowing out of manufacturing in yeah. this country. I don't know what we were thinking in terms of uh, going from the biggest exporter of steel to now the biggest importer of mm -hmm. steel, nine out of the 15 steel plants in China. Marco would, Rubio would say the same thing. And town after town, uh, losing industry, uh, and, and we didn't do anything. We, yeah. we, you know, if you go to these communities, there's a sense of betrayal, of anger, anger at both the whole political system. And so what Marco Rubio and I are saying is it's okay to have a strategy of economic development. Yeah. Every other country has that. That doesn't mean that we don't have the market. That doesn't mean that we don't have private sector. But 
our government, which is the most powerful institution ever invented in human history, should care about making sure that communities have economic opportunity. And we should care that the critical modern industries are here and that America be a manufacturing superpower, an economic superpower. Uh, it, it's not just Marco. I've, uh, Rubio, I mean, I've worked with people like uh, uh, Mike Gallagher on this, yeah. who's the chair of the China Select Committee. I mean, there's, th this is, I think, one hopeful strand for uh, the United States. And this, I'd love your thoughts, Bishop Barron. If it is hard for us to have a thicker conception of the common good, yeah. right? But Marco and I agreeing on issues of uh, abortion, where I'm, you know, just candidly for reproductive rights. He, I don't want to mischaracterize his, however he wants to characterize his position on, 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 on that. If those are hard conversations for us as a nation, mm -hmm. How can, can we find common ground, at least on the economics? It's maybe not at the highest plane, but building us yep. as a superpower on manufacturing, building us economically, can we at least find some common ground there that starts to move this country in a place where uh, we can push for our convictions on issues where we disagree, have a robust debate, do it respectfully, but also at the same time not be paralyzed? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, for Catholic social teaching, a healthy economy is a high moral value. So a healthy economy is producing jobs and helping well, families point. and, yeah. you know, helping a nation develop and creating wealth and all of that. That's a moral consideration. Uh, John Paul II said that the Catholic social teaching is key to the new evangelization. So if you want to evangelize, one way to do that is to make a moral commitment to improving the economy. So, no, I, I think... Uh, I'd be with you there. And hasn't Marco Rubio called his position a common good conservatism? Yes. Right? So a conservatism, but it's not a libertarianism or not a, you know, kind of just free market anything goesism, but but rather one that's directed toward the common good. And you sound in some ways like Ronald Reagan. I hope that's you don't see that as an insult, but I mean Reagan, who certainly would have favored, you know, keeping business here and, and making it stronger and, and he did simply, with Semitech, with the semiconductor yeah, industry. Right. And with, I mean, obviously I I, 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 I have ideological yeah. differences with him, but, but I'll tell you the one thing that Ronald Reagan had. When, when he gave the speech that if you go to Japan you, uh, as an immigrant, you, you can't be Japanese, and if you go to France, you can't be French. My parents came here as immigrants. Yeah. I was born here in Philadelphia in 1976. My wife often jokes saying, you take credit for that, but you had nothing to do with your birthplace or year. But, you know, a bicentennial baby, born in Bucks County, and at the age of 40, a grandson of someone who was a freedom fighter in Indian colonialism, a son of Indian immigrants, is elected to represent yeah. the economically most powerful place in the world in terms of wealth. That's us at that's our a, best. That's America. That's America at the best. That, right. that wouldn't happen in Germany. That no. wouldn't happen in France. That wouldn't happen in other places. And so... It, Ray, what, what we need, wh whether it's an, an Obama in this way or a Reagan, we need people, again, to, to believe in the aspirational story of America. This is the greatest nation yeah. ever conceived. And, I, and some things, the, the thing that bothers me the most about our moment uh, is, is the, the sense of losing that. We, we, we were losing that sense of how special this place is, how much we've how much sacrifice has gone into where we are. Yeah. Hey, can I ask you something with uh, the American ideals in mind? This famous debate today between what I call equality of opportunity versus equity of outcome. So right. in a lot of the woke debates today, uh, there seems to be a stress on equity of outcome that we need to just, you know, render the whole society racially or in terms of gender or whatever it is, ethnically equal. And I've always stood on the side of more of the classical liberal position of, Thomas Jefferson, and I would say Martin Luther King, right. it's not equity of outcome that we want, it's equality of opportunity, right. that that's the great American ideal. And equity of outcome, in fact, would call for an extraordinary manipulation of the society, an extraordinary intervention of, of the government and into the economy and all that. Help me with that. Uh, Bill Maher asked Bernie Sanders that question. Is yes. it equality of opportunity, equity of outcome? And Sanders said, it's equality of opportunity. And I thought, good. Give me your, your thought on that. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm obviously for an equality of opportunity. I mean, right. People should have the basic health care education to, 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 uh, to make uh, a life. But then I, you know, if you had equality of 
results that would mean that everyone would be making the same amount of money and have to be in the same houses. And, or 51% uh, uh, should be women uh, in every uh, aspect know, and, of life and 10%. And, and, that, yeah. uh, and that, that, that's n not respecting a person's individual initiative and uh, ambition. Where I think it becomes more challenging yeah. is, let's say, uh, equality of opportunity requires people to get to a five, right, in a yeah. race. And some people are starting out at yeah. uh, a, a two, and other people are starting out at a zero or a minus two. Then the question for a society becomes, do we do more to help the person at a minus two to get to yeah. the five? And, and that's been the affirmative action that's, argument the, 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 for a long time, right? And, and I, as far as it goes, it, I think, fine. But, you know. but, but it's, and, and I think that that, and I wish we could have that honest conversation yeah. in good faith yeah. instead of uh, where, where people are saying, look, we don't want inequality of outcome. Uh, we want equality of opportunity. And then let's discuss where, yeah. where that is and how that is. But it becomes so politicized that right. you, you can't do that. Yeah, no, fair enough. I wonder if this question will get you in trouble with your own uh, <laughs> constituency. But another part of Catholic social teaching, which I think is congruent with your thinking as I'm understanding it, Catholic social teaching doesn't like hyper concentrations of wealth and power. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, it, it look at G.K. Chesterton, who's an intellectual hero of mine, and he proposed back in the early part of the 20th century a, a system that he called distributism, and he saw it as in between socialism and, and a pure capitalism. And the idea there was distributing wealth, right? Now, not through the mechanism of the government necessarily, right. but but finding ways to distribute wealth and power throughout the society. Um, and look at his disciples, C.S. Lewis. Tolkien is a good example. Mm -hmm. You know, that a suspicion of a hyper-technologized capitalism right. you know, that rapes the environment and all that. And they favored a, a, a breaking up. Of, think of like Saruman in, in The Lord of the Rings, you know, kind of controlling <laughs> everything. And, right. uh, that's the tradition that, that's coming out of Catholic social teaching. So as you said, you've got in your own district some of the most some of the greatest hyper concentration of wealth and power right. in the history of the human race. Um, so let me ask just provocatively, should there be another Teddy Roosevelt? I mean, to break up these, these trusts, should we break up Google and Facebook and why not? Well, some of them, I think Facebook, we, 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 we should have because yeah. they've concentrated uh, Instagram uh, yeah. and uh, yeah. WhatsApp that should have been separate and having competition. And I've 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 supported uh, stronger antitrust enforcement on yeah. these companies so that they're not able to abuse their platforms and there are definitely antitrust violations. But I think it's going to require something beyond just antitrust because let's say you had and and I'm not saying it's uh, it, 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 we shouldn't consider it, but let's say you had three Googles all in Palo Alto, yeah, and you then had you know two different apples and you had four different. Uh, 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 three different Facebooks, uh, 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 and you have the AI revolution in my district. That's not going to do much for people in uh, in, in Youngstown, Ohio, yeah. right? And so I think the harder challenge is the internet was supposed to be distributed, yeah, right? And it ended up being concentrating. And how do we now intentionally uh, figure out incentives to distribute the economic opportunity and technology jobs? And that's what I've really been pushing with getting Google to partner with uh, community colleges, historically black colleges, yeah. Hispanic institutes, and uh, rural communities. Uh, so antitrust, I would say, is one uh, a, a quiver, uh, but not the, yeah, okay. uh, the whole solution. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Another, I think, instance of a hyper-concentration yes. of wealth in our society are the universities with yeah. these staggering endowments. Um, you know, look at what's Harvard? It's like fifty billion, sure. something like that. Yeah. I mean, part of me is my Chesterton side, my Catholic social teaching side. Is, Give me a break. Why any university would need a fifty billion dollar endowment? And to be fair, Notre Dame has a twenty or twenty five billion dollar right. endowment. Is this a good idea? Should there be that much wealth concentrated in these universities? Heck, for, for a billion, how about start a university in Africa? How about start a university in, you know what I'm saying? Is that another example where the, I don't know who would do it, but somehow break up that extraordinary uh, monopolizing of wealth? Well, I would say this. I mean, there's a, there, there, in some ways, I, I believe that higher education in universities, and I, I 
welcome your view on this, is it, it has been a huge asset for the United States sure. of America. Yeah, that, sure. And that these universities have produced research, but they've also produced uh, a, a sense of openness and scholarship at its best sure. uh, for the country. The challenge has become, I think, some of it the gamesmanship of people contributing to these places to be on yeah. the boards or to get their kids in. Right. And uh, and that needs to be cleaned up in terms of uh, what to do. And then, uh, y you know, in, in naming buildings, I mean, there are probably other better uses of uh, people's free money. It's not yeah. for them to decide what they want to do, but uh, th there are probably uh, better causes than just giving all of your wealth to your alma mater to get get a building named. Uh, I, 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 I'm I reluctant to go after universities because I will say this, I think that there has been a anti-intellectualism at the basis of some of the critiques of higher education mm. in, my, in my view. I mean, look, I think the country did a terrible disservice to people who didn't go to college yeah. and hollowed out the man manufacturing, hollowed out the middle class. But the flip of that shouldn't be uh, okay, we don't need PhDs, we don't need graduate students, we don't need college degrees. I think there's got to be a, a, a balance. Uh, there's a, Thomas Piketty is, uh, you know, I don't agree with all his conclusions, but he has this great research that in the 1950s, almost 80% of Americans were going to high school mm -hmm. compared to 30% in Europe. It yeah. gave us this huge advantage. And so I do want us to still invest in, in education in all forms. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, of course. Um, but something I found encouraging, actually, in, in my experience in recent years, the number of kids who are saying to me, when oh, no, I'm not going to college, I'm, I want to become a plumber, right. I want to become an auto mechanic. Which is fantastic. I'm like, yeah, and I say, terrific. A, you'll make a lot of money, yes. <laughs> I tell them. And B, I mean, maybe not everybody is, is uh, suited for you know, university studies. My, my parents' generation, rare was the person that went to college. Neither of my parents went to college. And, I, was, and I do think this gets to some of the elitism, right? Just because right. you went to college doesn't make you smarter or right. better or right. a better citizen or morally superior to someone who didn't. And there is this kind of snobbery of the college educated yeah. that I think uh, is not called for. I mean, a person who doesn't go to college uh, can have a great life. Uh, can have incredible opinions and thoughts and, uh, uh, and, and should be given as much credence in their opinions, as, 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 especially when it comes to democratic matters as someone who's yeah. a PhD. I think of it like a Tolkien again with the hobbits staying close to home and making their own tools and doing right. their own work. And uh, that was, now it's romanticized, obviously, right. but that was an ideal that they were embracing against a sort of elitism, I think. Hey, let me ask you a couple of particular issues that were really big when I was in California. I was out yeah. there for six years. I lived in Santa Barbara. I was auxiliary bishop for Los Angeles. So I, I saw came to know yeah. Southern California, you know. The homeless issue uh, got demonstrably, visibly worse in the six years I was there. Right. It was bad enough when I arrived in L.A. It was much worse when I left. Yeah. Um, as I looked at it over those years, I couldn't find a politician that was able to deal with this or had a, a reasonable solution. And it got worse, for right. sure. Give me the, the row kind of, you know, I know I'm oversimplifying, but give me three steps you would do to deal with this problem, which now it's all over my city here, Rochester. Yeah. It's all over the country, homelessness. Help me with that. It's a it's a huge challenge in California. First, yeah. you have to acknowledge that. Right. And uh, it, partly it comes also where you have high wealth concentration because yeah. when you have a lot of wealth yeah. production, People bid on the housing. The housing prices go up. It makes it harder uh, for people to afford rent. So if you look statistically around the country, places which have high wealth uh, generation and disparity end up often having a significant uh, housing problems. So what are three things? One, California didn't build enough housing. We were just mm -hmm. uh, too restrictive in yeah. uh, some of the zoning. Uh, and that was a big mistake. Don't copy California's build housing policy. We should be building a lot more housing, not just affordable yeah. housing, but housing in general. The second thing is uh, make sure you're intervening uh, before someone uh, is evicted in terms yeah. of providing assistance. Yeah. People say folks have an addiction problem, uh, mental health problems. There are a lot of people who have addiction problems and mental health problems who are housed. And that's much better than before they get evicted. And so I would have a program of aggressively monitoring people who are on their feet and making sure before they get uh, evicted, they have some assistance. And then mm. the third point would be uh, really having more 
uh, mental health and wellness and counseling in communities. And of course, this is gets back to Tocqueville, right? I mean, yeah. one of the reasons yeah. Tocqueville said you needed religious institutions, he said in a, in a place where you have freedom, freedom could go to licentiousness, we may not have any order, of, and we need family and community and, and religion uh, to give our life some social purpose so it's not just our own whims. And in a, in a society as complex as ours, we want religious institutions, others to do that, but we also want yeah. mental health wellness centers that, that give people an opportunity to get back on their feet. Those would be the three. Yeah, no, I appreciate things. that. It's just been such an intractable problem, hasn't it? And it really uh, has. I look Democrat, Republican, look across the spectrum, and we just don't seem to find a solution. Speaking of which, the other issue that it certainly preoccupies the bishops of our country, we, I, since I became a bishop eight years ago, we talk about it every single meeting. And that's immigration. Yes. Uh, when I was in California, obviously it was you know front and center issue, but it's all over our country. Um, everyone says it's like a cliche, almost a broken system. You know, yeah. and I think that's true. Um, Catholic social teaching, and this is a very important part of it, it, says yes to a nation's right to define and defend its borders, right. and and not just you know for xenophobic or jingoistic reasons. There are good moral reasons for that. You know, right. to maintain an, an economy can't handle this huge influx of people or whatever it is. There, there are good moral reasons. And to be honest with you, I think sometimes as a church we're not as good at articulating that that there's a moral reason why a nation can defend its borders. Okay, that's one feature of it. The other, of course, born of Jesus and the New Testament and the, right. and the prophets, is a great openness to the poor and to the, the marginalized and those who are threatened in their home country and right. all of that. By a deep instinct, we say, you know, yes. And then as Americans, you know, the Statue of Liberty, the right. huddled masses. I mean, so there's all these instincts in us, both American and Catholic, that say yes with the caution of defending borders. Okay. That seems to me at the principal level where we're And I agree with that framework, okay, I think so you would get 90% of Congress right, agreeing so with how, what how come we can't it. solve it? That's what, what if, frustrates a lot of us is, all right, I think we all kind of agree on those great principles. What's the main problem? Why can't we solve this? I think the the, the challenge has become it's it's so uh, politicized. I mean, the, yeah. the, 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 uh, the, there's a sense, I think, from some, and I don't want to be uh, unfair about it, but there is a, su a sense for some uh, that they, uh, maybe on our side, that we're not doing enough to protect the border. Like, we, we're, we, in my view, should be funding border agents. We should be funding immigration judges. We should be funding technology. We should clearly say we need, a nation needs safe and secure borders. Yeah. And, and there's, uh, and not be demonizing the, uh, the border patrol or, right. or, or not funding it. On the other hand, there also needs to be a, a, a recognition that, uh, that that immigration is still in, enriching to the United States yeah. and the, the uh, it, and there's got to be a pathway for people to come here. I, if, if, if there was a more orderly process, if you didn't have these awful scenes at the border yeah. where people yeah. are being, raped and where people to get to, to, to the border and where they're being harassed and it's this terrible, terrible journey. And if you didn't have the concentration of migrants in cities where they're not being able to work and where they're becoming a, a drain, I, I think that a lot of the, 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 the immigrants have integrated into the, 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 the country. And so the question is, how do we have an orderly asylum process? How do we have an orderly process to come into the United States uh, in a way that respects uh, the rule of law? And it, it's politically charged. Uh, but we can't find majorities in both houses that would agree with what you just said. It seems puzzling to me that we're not able to, over many, many years now, it's right. been years of trying to adjudicate this thing. And um, I don't know. It's a, it, 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 what you're saying makes perfect sense to me. I, and I, it's not going to happen in the 2024 election because we're just, yeah. we're so divided as a country. And then there's a, there, there's, there's a deeper issue of what's going on in this country. And that is, gets back to the point that we're trying to do something unprecedented. We're trying to become this multiracial, cohesive, multiracial democracy. And so people say, okay, it's fine if they play cricket in Rose District. Let's just make sure baseball remains the national pastime. And this is a, 
This is a real conversation that we need to have in this country is how do we embrace the new without discarding the old, the tradition? Where is that balance? And so much of our fight is the inability to see that nuance, that there are yeah. certain yeah. traditions of this country that we should embrace and that we make room for the new without just jettisoning the, the, the old, but it, it seems to me that the immigration debate is caught up on that, with some people yeah, saying yeah. change is happening too fast versus others saying, you know, no, we're still going to be this great melting pot of America. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, we're coming toward the end of our time. You knew I'd eventually get to this point where probably you and I have greatest disagreement, and that's yeah. around the abortion question. Um, and I want your advice on this, too. Yeah. And uh, the advice, because we, 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 we have different... You know, I am just because, so your viewers know, candidly, I mean, I've been 100% uh, a, a, a supportive of reproductive rights, and we'll talk about it in more detail. But how can we have a conversation in this country where we disagree on issues on abortion or if there are issues of gay marriage or other things? How do we, how do we find if there is any possibility of... Uh, a, a way to talk to each other. Well, I, I think two things. First of all, the appeal to natural law that we talked about earlier. There's some kind of fundamental moral consensus around uh, these ethical questions. I think if we can stand together in those, that would be at least a, a starting point. The other one, to be frank with you, uh, to, to my mind, the democratic position on that has become so extreme that it's, it's precluding real conversation. It's become such an extreme position. Let me tell you, put it in a little context. Um, I'm from Chicago. I'm a Catholic, right? My dad, uh, Irish Catholic from Chicago, that meant ipso facto Democrat. If, if you're a Chicago Catholic, you're a Democrat. In fact, my father was involved in Democratic politics. His family was very involved in Chicago politics. Um, when I went to the seminary, so like in the early 80s, 95% of us, so these, you know, serious Catholic young people, 95% of us would have said we're Democrats, right? Uh, when I started teaching at the seminary 20-some years later, 95% would have said we're Republicans. It's one reason, one reason for that, I would say, above all, and it was, the, it was Roe v. Wade, and it was abortion. Uh, and as I've watched it over the years, I'm old enough to remember as a little kid Ted Kennedy was pro-life, yeah. Jesse Jackson was pro-life, and they were pro-life, it seems to me, on very democratic grounds. They mean, hey, we're the party of the little guy, we're the party that defends, you know, the, the poor and those that have no voice. And so I watched that, and then I watched by a steady process, uh, abortion being accepted almost as a, an absolute. I remember vividly Mario Cuomo, 1984, right, at Notre Dame. I was in my mid-20s then. And the anguished Mario Cuomo, you know, I'm a Catholic, and so of right. course I'm against abortion, but yet with, you know, reluctance, but accepting the exigency of it politically, I, I will ex support it, but, you know, I'm, I'm a tortured soul, right? And I'm privately against it, but publicly for it. And, of course, that was picked up by Democrats, Catholic Democrats, for the next two generations. But what I find intriguing is the declension from anguished Mario to exultant, um, what's it, Andrew. So when Andrew Cuomo in New York, when they passed the, a law that makes abortion, you know, universally available, up to the moment of birth, they're lighting up buildings in New York and, and jumping with celebration. For a lot of Catholics, it was like, come on. I, I mean, I, I might give a certain benefit of the doubt to anguished Mario, but exultant Andrew, it seemed like it had gone to such an extreme position that it's all on one side, and that it's precluding the, the possibility for real conversation. I've said to um, uh, friends of mine in Washington involved in politics, give us a little, give us a little bit. I said, how about we limit, you know, third trimester abortions? Oh, no, that could, that could never happen. How about partial birth? Why don't we limit that? Oh, no, no, it would never pass. How about born alive? <laughs> you know, oh, no, no, we couldn't do that. And I'm like, well, then what the heck? I mean, how can we even have a conversation if the position has become so extreme? Anyway, end of speech on that. But that, that would be, from my perspective, as someone born and raised a Democrat, but who, who experienced extraordinary difficulty precisely over this issue. And, this, and you think this is one of the big issues that Catholic Democrats just yep. sociologically left the Democratic yep. Party? Yep. 
Oh, I do. I mean, look at the last, who was the last pro-life Democrat? Dan Lipinski, whom I knew in Chicago, hounded out of office. What about, you know, I mean, I, I know you may push back on this, but the framework in, at least in my state in California, is, is the sta- that you can have an abortion un- up till viability, and then after that, uh, it's an exception for the health uh, of the mother in that circumstance, which is, which is very, very rare. I mean, it's not a, uh, a, a common thing that, 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 that people are doing. And now my view is that that decision should be between, for the woman and, and, and her doctor in, in getting that health care. But I think the, the challenge is that we also start to talk about these uh, exceedingly rare cases that then become the the conversation where that's that's not the majority of uh, abortions or by by any stretch probably less than one or two percent that are taking taking place. And, yeah. Well, let, let's say even if that were the case, that it is a, it's still a lot of uh, babies being yeah. murdered from our perspective. Right. And how is that ever acceptable within a decent society? Um, you know, so that's and now that the thing has moved to the state level after the you know, Dobbs decision. Okay, good. I, I'll I'll take any restriction I can get. I mean, so if if Democrats are willing to say, look, we'll restrict it here or there, great, great. And and the church, I think, would would embrace that and say, good. At least we're moving in the right direction. Um, but I think we have to have a conversation about about life and about the, the human being. And uh, you know, to me, it's become almost an ideological position that that prior to birth, for some reason. <laughs> What we're talking about is not uh, a human being. And I think that's an incoherent position. I remember Hillary Clinton, it must have been 2016, and was asked about that. The baby about to be born has no constitutional rights. And she said, yes, that's the, the law of our country. And I, I remember thinking, okay, then something has deeply gone wrong with the laws of our country. So I would say I'm speaking for a lot of Catholics there who would, by instinct, like an awful lot of things within, you know, the, the, the more liberal or democratic framework. But we balk at this, you know. And uh, it's, it, it's hard if there is just fundamental difference, though, though not uh, judging someone's view. You think it is hard to build consensus on other areas. I mean, this is such no, a, yeah. it, it, uh, I mean, and it's hard, you can. And indeed, I think our conversation might represent that even, right. that we can find a lot of points of contact, but it's it's a big issue, you yes. know. No, the bishops have called it the, the preeminent issue and for two reasons. One is it's a direct attack on life. And secondly, the sheer numbers involved of roughly a million abortions a year. Um, and we just think that's a staggering outrage morally. So for that reason, the bishops have said it's the preeminent issue, not the only one. And, and we take very seriously all these things we've talked about. And I think with Democrats, we can find a lot of common ground. As I say, most of us, like when I was young, most of us were Democrats. And uh, this has been, yeah, um, a very tough pill to swallow, you know. Well, it's a, it, it's a challenge uh, for the country because obviously yeah. the, 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 this is a it, it's an it, it, I don't I disagree with people on the other side but I I don't I don't uh, claim to know metaphysical questions I mean these are deep questions that uh, you know that I I respect people who have have a difference I have a clear sense that for for me uh, these things should be a, a, the decision between the a, a woman and and, and health care and that that's the 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 the, the and the law requires health considerations after after viability but I, I and I'm not saying that this can um, bridge a divide and I don't want to diminish yeah. the moral sentiment or moral intensity on the other side but I think that there is such a, a a moral conviction on on both sides on this that the question becomes one can we have this conversation but it also becomes how do we at least, uh, respect where people are coming from, yeah. which means it, it, in, a, in a simple way uh, to say that if someone disagrees with me, I won't uh, label them uh, a, a sexist. And if someone, uh, and they shouldn't label me, you know, a baby killer. Or so, I mean, I, how do we have conversations yeah. with each other? No, quite right. That, and- that, that, uh, that still allow us to have a common American identity and build uh, for that, because it's 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 uh, uh, 
it's harder for me to see a path to consensus over the next 10 years on that than it is to see we want to become a manufacturing superpower. We don't want China to lead. We yeah. want to make sure we have jobs and economic yeah. opportunity everywhere. Uh, we want to become this great multiracial democracy. Yeah, and it's it's a thorny question to be sure. And I think just to keep creating the space where the conversation can unfold is a good thing. I'm in favor of that. And I would say the recovery of something like a natural law framework so that we're not just asserting our freedom over and against each other. That's a non-starter, it seems to me. When, well, here's my point of view, your point of view, we'll vaguely tolerate each other. Can we find at least some moral common ground, you know, to talk about it? I would encourage that. But um, no, I, I think there's there's plenty of room for um, for conversation and for agreement on some, you know, pretty important things. And um, the church takes very seriously the political conversation. As I say, the political conversation has enormous moral implications. Uh, the church would kind of stand with Aristotle. Politics is a moral enterprise, right? First and foremost. Right. It's not something divorced from morality. It's a pragmatic concern off to the side. No, it's by its nature a, a, a moral uh, project, the political project. So I think, you know, um, I hope our conversation today is a good example of how um, we can pursue that conversation. Well, I've enjoyed it. I've yeah. learned from, from your uh, perspective and erudition. We live in a country where the incredible is possible. And yeah. I, I think that the one thing we both share is this profound love for this nation, yeah. of the yeah, genius right. of yeah. every individual. I mean, that's so unusual. And I, I maybe end with, with this perspective. And I, I do think this is consistent with, or you tell me if it is, but it's inconsistent with Catholic teaching. And that is that for most societies, the people who could have a good life were the few, the rulers, yeah. the aristocrats, yeah, yeah. the the scholars. Right. And we have this radical idea that yes. there's a genius of every individual. There is a, every person has deep worth. Every person has a, a divinity and a, and, a, and a specialness. And that's a uniquely American yeah. concept. And, and that's what makes this country exceptional, so unique in my, in my view. Yeah, I know the possibility of really distributing wealth and power so it's not just in the hands of a few. Yeah, I think that's exactly a, an American and a Catholic ideal at the same time. Congressman, thank you. Thank you. A thank delight you. talking to you today. I really enjoyed it. Thank God you for having you. me. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.